where I want to be with the music is I'm not thinking, I don't know where I am, I don't know who I am, I'm just in the moment. It's happening and it's cool and it's timeless and you're just like, you know, you're at the point, you know, that, that thing, you know, crashing the car, first kiss or something, but the time stops, that's what I want, you know, that's where I want to be. And, you know, I mean, time doesn't stop when you're fixing your hair or something like that. You can't be like ego invested or thinking about yourself or thinking in sentences or doing anything that's got anything to do with anything other than being like as absent as you possibly can so that you can be in the moment. Here we are with Steve Kimmock. Steve, so glad to have you on here. So for everyone out there listening, Steve, well known in the jam band scene for playing with guys like the Grateful Dead, some of the Fish guys and bands like Rat Dog, the other ones, Phil and Friends. And Steve also has some incredible solo work out there. Steve, man, can't wait to catch you in Columbus this September. I'll see you on the 24th at Woodlands. And uh, yeah, man, so glad to talk with you here. Steve, are you familiar with Victor Wooten? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Nice. So one of my favorite books, it's, it's called The Music Lesson by Victor Wooten. He was, wrote this book. And, and there's a quote from the book, like, anyone can play music, but the best musicians allow music to play them. And he talks about how musicians are, are really, in, in the highest form, they're allows, allowing music to emerge by kind of tapping into it. And I'd love to hear your take on this and kind of what your imagination is like when you're improvising. Oh, Jesus. Um, it depends. You know, it, it, it depends on, 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 on what else is going on. And, you know, I think when it's actually good, when it gets going, you know, um, I don't think anybody is really, you know, like thinking in sentences or something like that. You know, you're probably a, a little more in the moment than that. And a little less of the, the duality of, you know, okay, now I'm doing this now, you know, it's not, it's not like that. At the same time, man, there's definitely stuff that I will use to kind of, um, you know, get a, get a grip, get a toehold, gain purchase, launch from a higher spot, you know, or whatever. But it's different, you know, it just, it really depends. It depends what else is going on. You know, like if I, I might hear, um, well, I'll give you an example. I might hear a, I might hear something that's unambiguously major, right? And think, okay, well, I'm going to come right in with, come in with something that's not major just to like um open it up or if um what's it um uh, if you know if if there was a, a vamp with an altered dominant chord maybe i would just say i'm not i'm not going there <laughs> I've heard Dickie Betts do this on, uh, I think it's in Mountain Jam, in Mountain Jam where uh, they're playing over, a, a, the band's vamping an altered dominant chord, it's this. And Dickie is, he's playing like just straight pentatonic major over, you know, just to be a pain in the ass, I think, you know, and that's great. So, I mean, I'll look for that initially you know it's like it, it is is this in a mode that i recognize how can i you know open that you know if sometimes if it's major i'll play minor you know, stuff like that but i hear that a lot in uh if you listen to the, the afro pop some of the afro pop stuff there'll be a long guitar solo that's unambiguously major and then the saxophone will come back in and over the same groove the same you know, thing, it'll be completely minor and like a quarter tone 
out of tune, you know, just like in another place entirely. And I like that, you know, um, when, when there's different, uh, uh, when the soloist takes advantage of the perspective that the accompaniment or that the, you know, the band would offer to, uh, to stretch it out. And what do you think it is that, about that, about that juxtaposition, you know, taking a major vamp and coming in maybe with like a minor phrasing over it? What, what do you think it is about that, that attracts you to it? I think I just like the variety and the contrast, you know, um, I, I, I like, you know, more music, you know, it's like, oh, there's another note in there, you know, um, you know, there's some element of surprise to it, you know, um, as, as well. I just like hearing more notes, I think, or, or, you know, like more pitches. I'm okay with the idea that, you know, that these different pitches can associate and it's not necessarily like tied to the chord. There's still a tonic, you know, there's still a, a you know, an acoustical foundation to the thing, you know, there's some, you know, there's some note that's telling you, okay, here's home, you know, but. You know, so to me, is every bit as... I mean, I don't have to hear it. Zooming out a little bit, I'd love to hear you describe why music made up spontaneously um, can just be so moving. I, I, I'm not sure I entirely uh, agree with the, 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 the premise that because the music would be spontaneous, I might get might be some emotional thing happens because of that or 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 not i i i think like at the very beginning of the thing for me i would think of music as you know a succession of feeling states you know you're, you feel this way in it you feel that way you know that there's uh maybe there's some uh, harmonic function or something like that like i was just saying there's like a tonic you know so you can tell when when you've uh, achieved that that uh psychological feeling of the preservation of rest when you reach a sonic chord and you're like okay we're home you know um, and then you can hear when you're you know away 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 and going back to it you know right? um, but I, I think I, 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 I think that um, the music as a, a succession of feeling states exists, whether it's spontaneous or not. Now, if I'm playing it and I'm in the middle of it, there's a bunch of guys and all of a sudden we're in some place that's genuinely new, then you, you have to react to that somehow. You don't go like, no, oh, it's new, you know, when do we get out of here? Are we done yet? <gasps> new music, you know. You don't feel like that. That's not the that's not the accompanying feeling state to the surprise of being in a genuinely new place with everybody. Everybody looks up and goes, "Oh man, this is cool," you know. Um, but I don't think that's got anything to do with this. You know, like listening as a listener, um, because I, I mean I, I listen to a lot of uh, music that's composed as as well as spontaneously improvised, and and. I, I, I don't get less feeling. I like that answer. I like that answer a lot. And I, and I love what you, what you mentioned about this place of newness when, you know, it's, it's a place we haven't been before. Um, I'd love to ask you like principles that apply to improvisation. Do you feel like they, they apply to other avenues of life or other disciplines? Well, yeah, I, 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 I would, I would, I would, I would think so. Well, for example, in practical terms, you know, in, a, in an ensemble, in an improvising ensemble, may, job number one is probably matching dynamic intensity. You know, like, you don't, like, if everybody's like, just kind of chilling out, you don't want to come raging in with some bullshit on top of it. You want to, you know, so 
I'm just trying to match your energy. Okay. You know, it might be a good way to deal with people just generally, you know, or, or, or recognizing that maybe if you de-escalated a situation that somebody else could de-escalate it to. For me personally, I struggle with an awareness of like um, audience expectation. You know what I mean? Like I've gotten in front of some of these crowds with some of these bands and I just know that people are like, they want something and <laughs> not me. <laughs> and I got to like go, ah, shit, I gotta go. I really want to do my best here for the band and for the audience and just, you know, just in general. And uh, you know what I mean? Like some of the Grateful Dead related stuff, you know, like the, you know post, post Jerry stuff. You don't want to be a guitar player and get on that stage. You just don't, you know, it's like, no, that's, that's not me. And that guy you're looking for, you know, he's not there. Um, and so what do you, you know, how do you deal with that? So, I mean, I, I, I try and, I try and deal with that by not, um, like just sort of caving into that duality, you know, like there's, there they are and here I am and I want this and they want that and I don't know what they want or I don't know what I want or what should I do or my feet hurts or oh that's that guy or oh that's that gal, you know, it's like I try and get away from that as much as I possibly can. Um, you know, because I think the duality like just duality in general is not that place where I want to be in the music. Where I want to be with the music is I'm not thinking, I don't know where I am, I don't know who I am, I'm just in the moment. It's happening and it's cool and it's timeless and you're just like, you know, you're at that point, you know, that, that thing, you know, crashing the car first kiss or something like that. Time stops. That's what I want, you know. That's where I want to be. And, you know, I mean, time doesn't stop when you're fixing your hair or something like that. You can't be like ego invested or thinking about yourself or thinking in sentences or doing anything that's got anything to do with anything other than being like as absent as you possibly can so that you can be in the moment. So I practice that off the bandstand. Like if I got to deal with people, as soon as I start feeling like I have to push back or pull back or anything, I just go, oh, wait a minute. This is one of these places that I don't want to be in. I don't want to practice being in this place. I have to let this go. You know, otherwise I'm just carrying this, you know, confrontational kind of duality you know, on the stage with me, and I don't want to do that, you know. It's a little, I mean, it's a little tricky. It's not easy to talk about, and it's, uh, you know, because it's, it's, you know how you have to feel to make things work, and you know how you feel when things are, are working, and, you know, it's not about arguing or getting your way or something like that. It's not an ego thing. Do you ever think about the origins of music and as humans, how, how we kind of discovered music and like the purpose music has served. Well, well, yeah. Um, what I'm hearing you say is like that, like music is something that people did or figured out. And I don't think they really figured it out. Like, I think it's, I think, uh, I think people are inherently musical. You know, that it's a, a, a birthright, you know, kind of like color vision or something like that, you know, that there's stuff about our, our consciousness or our existence that's just beautiful or that allows us to experience beauty or wonder, you know. Um, I think it's just in there. I think that, I think stuff has happened along the way that, um, got us maybe away from that, you know, like specialization, right? Like, I'm, I'm, you know, it's like, 
I'm a guitar player. And that's like a kind of a specialization, like if you were a dentist, you know, or a dude with a, with a podcast or a professional wrestler. No matter, author, painter, surfer. People do stuff, but they tend to specialize these days, you know what I mean? And I, I, I think there was a time, you know, I mean, many thousands of years ago where people weren't that specialized, where everybody sang, everybody played, everybody grew some food, everybody looked around for something to eat, everybody tried to catch a fish, everybody figured out how to start a fire. Everybody did everything. And there was like one knowledge and everybody had, you know, po you know, post the development of agriculture and Pythagoras and a bunch of other stuff that, that got us into some kind of hierarchies and, and oh, it's, we just got more specialized. You know, all of a sudden there's people that, you know, just farmed. And then there's people that just kept the books, you know, about the farm. Then you had to install some jerk off at the top, and so then there was a king. Or um, but all of that stuff, I think, takes us further from the idea that we're all just musical, and that we should all be kind of singing and playing and dancing and enjoying mm. that. And that the, um, the idea that 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 you know. Um, like from the other side of the glass, that there might be some personification that this and this guy and this thing is like, like that the music is like, it's not, it's not, it's not. The music is your, just your own emotional response to sound and you respond to sound emotionally. Trust me, whether, you know, you're aware of it or think you're controlling it or not. You're, you're a musician, you play guitar, right? Right, so I, I dabble in in all the specializations. Okay, so here's the here's here, here's here's the here's the lesson. I gave you a guitar lesson right now. Prove my point or not, but you try it. So you sit with the guitar and you don't play it. You just sit with it in your lap and you do like a gut check kind of thing where you just go, "Am I okay?" You know, or "Who am I?" or whatever. And you just like let yourself kind of like. kind of vibrate down to being not lying to yourself about everything, you know, you see how you feel. And then after a while, just let your, after you're calm, you know, you can just let your hand fall and you'll hear a sound. And as soon as you hear that sound, something changes in your body. You feel it in your body. You go, something happens. You hear a sound and something happens immediately. And, all of the sounds we make affect us somehow, you know, whatever those sounds are. You know, I mean, we've been reacting to sound since, you know, we heard our mother's voice when we were babies. Or since we heard our kids cry, you know, when they're born. It's like always, always sound, always reacting to sound. It's the last thing in your consciousness you know, when you finally pass out. It's the first thing that comes into your consciousness when you wake up. It's like that layer between the bullshit that you think you know and the monkey mind and the talking and sentences and the, the, the depth of it, you know. That's where that lives, mm. you know. It's in between those, those, play, those states. I'd love for you to talk to me throughout your career and, and in your life. What's brought you fulfillment and how that's maybe different than the success you've had? Oh, well, that's a little tricky. Um, yeah, that's a little tricky for me because I've gotten a lot of, I think I've gotten, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense at all. I think I've gotten fulfillment out of practicing without thought of reward. You know what I mean? Like a, a, a lot of times when I work, like I'm not particularly talented or bright. I just work really hard all the time and I don't know what I'm doing. And, you know, I mean, you kind of can't 
know what you're doing if you're trying to find something that you don't know what it is. It's like, it's ridiculous. And so you, you have to like not think that you're immediately going to, well, if I do this, you know, then this. And it's like, you don't know. You don't know where any of it goes or why, you know. So you just have to do what work that you can think of to do without thinking you're going to get anything out of it. And so I've done a bunch of that. And I think I got something out of it. Approaching things without some sort of agenda or, or goal of achievement, like you're describing, is that something you've had to kind of grapple with and learn throughout your life to kind of release that end result? I get a lot of pushback from people around me. I'm notoriously um, not goal oriented. It pisses people off. I don't have a goal. <laughs> I don't have a goal. I just want to have an authentic, what feels to me like an authentic relationship with the instrument. Was there a point where that mind state clicked for you, or is that kind of always the way you've been? I don't know. Probably as a young teen, I went, oh, I want to do this. And then I, I think I realized kind of just in a, in a moment, you know, there was like a little a little enlightenment kind of thing. I was like, oh, I could do that, but that means that I can't really do anything else. <laughs> or like, well, you're not going to have a job. You're not going to have a car. You're probably not going to have a girlfriend. You're not going to have much to eat. You're going to have to wait for somebody to bring you shoes when you don't have any shoes. But I did that just like that for a long time. You know. Uh, yeah, I just, I just played and... I didn't do anything else. And I just wanted to do that. It was really hard. It's really hard to do. Um, that's the hardest thing to do, is to just stay on a, a path, you know, in this world, you know, to stay on a path that's not part of the regular, uh, you know, regular white man work a day world thing. You know? <laughs> so, you know, branching off from this, you know, the regular life of a person and you know, you, you have your, your unique life path and we're only here though for a short time. And I'm curious, like from your perspective of, you know, you're, you're in this place where you're, you're able to be not goal oriented and kind of be free from an agenda. Do you ever think about death and the end of life and the shortness of life as, as something that motivates you? Like how I'm curious to learn from you, how you in your own mind, like resonate with the idea of the end of life? Well, that's tricky too. Um, what a good question. I'm not really, I'm really not sure how to, how to, uh, answer that. I mean, it's, it's not, I don't know that it's of great interest to me philosophically or, 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 or spiritually the idea that that uh you know there's this approaching nothingness you know yeah that's a really good question i i think of it more in practical terms you know um how i'm gonna you know <laughs> how i'm gonna get off this roller coaster you know with the least amount of damage to my uh you know, family and friends. I think about that, you know, like how, what do, what do I got to do to bail that's not going to completely impoverish and screw everybody up, you know, um, if I discover I'm on my way out. You know, I mean, like my dad, may he rest in peace, passed away uh, quite a few years ago, but maybe 20 years before that, you know, he wound up in the hospital. Um, he had a heart attack. Right? They saved his life. And when he got back to the hospital, he was really pissed. He was like, these bastards have robbed me of the luxury of dying peacefully in my sleep. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, as he knew then, you know, it was just going to be like this endless doctor back and forth, you know spiraling and 
train kind of thing. And that's no fun. So, I mean, I just as a, as a um, you know, as a culture, you know, I don't think we've got a super healthy relationship with, with end of life stuff. So jumping back to, to talking about music and, you know, you can almost see this next question as an analogy through what we were just talking about. One of the most central themes of, of this whole music scene that you and I love is tension and release. I'd love to hear from you as, as the musician, your perspective on tension and release and what about it can cause a, a profound reaction from the standpoint of you as a music fan, um, but also from the standpoint of you as a musician using it as a tool. Okay. <laughs> That's also a really good question. Um, so if you have tension to release, right, then you've got some kind of polarity. There's like, there's all the way over here and then there's all the way over there, right? And there might be some, uh, there might be some objective measure to that, you know? Um, and it, it, some of it might just be our, our, you know, cultural precondition, you know, or cultural that we think that this is tense and that this is, you know, I, th I, th I think people say it without understanding it more than they actually do anything about it. You know what I mean? Because there's, there's very little harmonically, functionally that is that exactly, you know, I mean, I know we have this whole idea of like, you know, five, one cadences and stuff like that, you know, where there's a, you know, a home and a return and stuff like that. But um, we'll go back to the Grateful Dead for a minute. Grateful Dead music. The thing that they did that was most different, I think, than most bands. Because I got to work with all of those guys at different times. You know? And they all agreed on like one thing about the music, which was there would be a dynamic map of the thing, you know, that there would be, you know, some kind of density or activity that was like, you know, that was like a baseline. And then, you know, this verse would be above that. But then this line of the verse would be below that, right? And, you know, wh whatever other kind of stuff went on, they didn't micromanage every little beat on the hi-hat or I mean, this note on the guitar or that note necessarily. Just that there was generally, like, um, there was some kind of zero point for, you know, an amount of activity that they would go above and below. And then you build it way up and then you smack it way down to nothing. And then you've got your, your, uh, you know, your dynamic cadence, you know, there's a tension and, and, and release just of, of, of the dynamic quality of the music that I think that is the number one move, right. Of tension and release. It's that it's, it's, it's intensity, it's dynamics. It's not, it's not, people don't dance to chords and, you know, nobody, nobody cares about chords. Nobody gives a shit about notes, you know? Like they don't, you know? I play all kinds of cool chords and people sit there and they look at me like, what's up? You know? But man, you like go, bah, 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 boom, and smack it down. The whole place goes crazy taking their clothes off and stuff they're so happy that they you know that something happened you know that kind of tension and release that's real you can see that happen you know this other stuff where people go oh well there's you know here's here's this note look here you know on a dominant chord now i'm playing a flat 13 and it's like Fuck you. <laughs> you know, it's got nothing to do with it. That's nobody's gonna nobody's gonna jump out of their seat for that. And they don't. Yeah, yeah. So there's 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 this idea that there's tension and release. Or maybe um I, I you know, I, I look at it uh, 
in terms of of of, uh, of you know pitch or frequency or harmony as opposed to just like amplitude you know uh, variation as a tonic non-tonic differentiation here's the flip side to that that i do think and i do subscribe to the idea that there are more resolved aspects of tonality and less resolved aspects of tonality it's not like binary i don't know because you're talking about music theory before and there's a lot of people man that said uh, um think well over a certain chord that you know or a tonic that this scale is you know out and this scale is in kind of thing but they all got the same same notes man in all the scales That's what so you're, you're saying it really a lot of it actually comes down to to the dynamics and and the change in rhythmic intensity yeah it's just noise it's just if you make a really big noise and then you knock it down to nothing everybody goes wow or if you're like really chill and then bam make some giant event you know people react to that if there's tension and release it should have an effect <laughs> you know what i mean if there should be some obvious effect of it you know like you go oh look there that happened you go yeah right it's be some observable you could look and go oh yeah there's tension and release you know i mean point to it somewhere else hmm. i can't you know i've been trying to do this all my life and and I, i'm not you know maybe life and death you know but then if we're if we're doing the um, as i suggested before that there's a that the music you know proceeds as a succession of feeling states you feel this way you feel that way it's like, oh wow oh no you know whatever and that there's some polarity that means that there must be some emotional polarity and there's not you can only work with this idea that you feel a certain way about some resonance by looking at that resonance every day and going well how do i feel about this you know mm -hmm. and you know you you, you might um... how do i feel about that note today <laughs> I'm more there today, you know what I mean? Um, and you know, those notes are, are, are uh, you know, kind of opposite in their, in their function, being like a major third and a minor third, you know? Um, but they don't stay there because I don't have an emotional center, you know, right? Like if I was in love with a girl, she broke my heart. That's like, that's like one emotional polarity, right? But what's the opposite of that? What's the opposite of deeply in love with a broken heart? Like, like an opposite experience that might, you know, maybe you're just sitting at the bar with somebody and you're having a really good time and it's just, it's just fun. But how are those, you know, and how are those opposites? It's like the, the actual, you know, the, um, the emotional parts of it don't, agree with like an idea of polarity like the one's 180 degrees out of phase with the other you know mm. i mean what's 180 degrees out of phase with laughing with a stranger at a bar is the bar broken i don't know where, where, where's the middle of that mm. you know? so the whole idea that there's objective polarity is just it doesn't work i've been hearing all my life trying to study music about tension and release and stuff like that i'm like I don't know what what is that you know and so and and uh, and some parts of it I get like here's it so if I had it you know something like that's like tense Supposedly, you know, and then it's supposed to go where? Right? Mm -hmm. 
But what is it about that that's tense? And, 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 and how is it how is it different than this sound? How is it different than that proceeding to You know, I, I I hear personally when I hear some of the um, some of the altered stuff, I just hear it as being not pretty. You know, <laughs> I don't hear it as being tense. I just go, oh, that's kind of mm. ugly. You know, um, and then when I hear some of it. Uh, like, like, uh, here, all right. here's a good example. I hear that as being major. But I don't hear the opposite of it. I don't hear it's reciprocal as being minor. I just hear it as being... Like to me, like C sharp and F are both thirds in A, you know, and so just they're just on opposite sides of some continuum, and not necessarily a a, a, a polarity. Um, or, or here's another example. Like I hear this. As being minor. You know, um, it's not a minor third in it. It doesn't sound like, you know. But it's, to me, it just sounds minor. So I've got my own idea about what are the associations of which pitches that suggest a tonality to me. And then I, I, I deal with those pitches on a or those harmonies, I don't deal with them like on a daily basis, you know. I just listen and I go, do I like this today? You know, or do I, or do I like that? You know? mm. I love it. Well, Steve, so great to talk with you here. Let us into your mind for at least a little bit. And one final question for you as we're starting to wrap up. Looking back on on the lessons you've learned on your life, on who you are and what you're all about, if there's one message or, or mantra or you know piece of advice um, that you can share, what would you say that might be? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, wow, I wish I had an answer ready for that. But one thing that kind of sums it up. No, do your best to be a friend, you know? I mean, seriously. I love it. Yeah, just, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> it's like, uh, um, kind of corollary to don't be a dick. <laughs> just, yeah, I mean, I mean, really, that's all. Just be kind, I guess. So great to talk to you. Can't wait to see you in Columbus. Thanks again for your time, Steve. Thank you so much, man. This has been a real pleasure. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff going on there. Keep it up. Well, if you made it this far, thank you for tuning in. Big shout out to our sponsor, Thrax. Check them out if you're looking for some incredibly high quality CBD and THC gummies. Also, big shout out to J&J &J Distribution. Retailers, check out their brands, Kush Burst, 
death by gummy bears and compassionate buds. Also, big shout out to SEM Tickets. If you're throwing events and you're looking for a reliable ticketing source that's well-priced, look no further. Got links in the description. Much love, y'all.